invented last year called, uh, called the Unsupervised Learning for AI ML bots. Probably our biggest challenge as bot masters, chatbot developers, and I think maybe everyone here would agree with this statement, is um, the content creation problem. And um, by that I mean it's possible to create an intelligent sounding bot by programming a certain number of responses or learning a certain number of responses for the bot, probably on the order of 10,000 responses, we can pick a number out of the air. And um, in, order to, in order to create 10,000 responses, if you think of, if you think of um, the ability to write one AIML category per minute as sort of a benchmark level for a skilled bot master, 10,000 works out to one week of 24-7 time. So for practical purposes, you might think of one or two people working over a course of one or two or three months to create the content for a bot. This is a huge obstacle in, in, um, in the area of marketing and selling bots because uh, customers often don't want to commit the resources necessary to create a really high quality bot. And um, what, of, what often can happen is that they'll try to apply too few resources to the problem and end up with something less than the quality that they expected and be disappointed with the result. So um, uh, another aspect of, of this is something that Simon Lehman called continuous beta testing, which a couple of people have touched upon here today already. And that means that even once you've deployed the bot, there has to be a person, the bot master there, to continuously monitor the conversations and update the bot based on um, new conversational input, new areas of knowledge that come in. And um, if you're using a scripted language like AIML to create your bot, then um, it's really a significant uh, resource dedication to, to um, develop a high quality intelligence sounding bot. There are basically two broad approaches to teaching a bot knowledge. And these terms are, are classical terms from the field of pattern recognition theory, supervised learning and unsupervised learning. And in supervised learning, a person, the teacher, has a crucial role. Uh, and in unsupervised learning, it's more like the idea that Turing had in mind in his original 1950 paper, that you could sort of teach a bot to um, uh, learn language like a child does just by sort of telling you things, and eventually it would build up a repertoire of knowledge. Uh, supervised, unsupervised learning, um, you could think of that in, in pattern recognition as something like, suppose you wanted to classify uh, something like blood cells. Well, blood cells have features. They have you know, size, area, um, diameter, color, um, and that sort of thing. And if you, you, know, if you, if you create a space of those, features, then each blood cell uh, is represented by a point in that space. If, it's, if you wanted to distinguish between, let's say, healthy cells and unhealthy cells, then the teacher could look at, that, at the clouds of data and say, OK, this cloud over here represents the unhealthy cases, and this cloud over here represents the healthy cases. If you want to do that in an unsupervised way, then you would use a technique, something like cluster analysis, to try to automatically factor that space into pattern regions. Um, in, this, in the case of the bot, the supervised learning involves training from the conversation logs, like uh, David Nudo was talking about. Someone has to actually read the conversation logs, or a program has to read the conversation logs, and figure out places where the bot does not give a satisfactory answer. And then the teacher, the bot master, has to write a good answer for that particular input case. Um, <clears throat> In the case of uh, Pandora Box, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've developed an algorithm called targeting, which basically creates a report that says, here are the uh, top 100 or 1,000 most activated patterns. And if the patterns contain a wildcard, that means that the, the bot recognized part of the input, but not all of the input. So if there's, if there's, uh, if there's a wildcard in the pattern, that, that combined with the actual input creates an opportunity for the bot master to write a more refined response. Um, we've also, uh, a couple of years ago, released a technology called SuperBot, which is a kind of a blank template for a bot. And what that is, is the, 
is a list of the top 10,000 most activated patterns in the Alice bot. And then somebody who wants to create a bot with a distinct personality from Alice can take that list of patterns and essentially fill in the blanks to create uh, unique responses, which are different than the Alice bot's responses. So these are examples of ways of, um, of training about the supervised learning. And, and supervised learning it always involves a process of creative writing. The, the bot master, the most important skill for the bot master is not computer programming, but basically being able to write English sentences which are believable and entertaining and keep the, the client chatting with the bot. Now this is all in contrast to unsupervised learning where there's essentially no teacher. And this is the approach taken by UltraHal and also by uh, Cleverbot, um, for those of you familiar with that, where basically um, the, um, the responses are learned by taking uh, inputs from clients and, and passing them back to other clients. Right? And so if, if the bot receives something that it doesn't know the answer for, then it takes that input and, and uses it as an output to another client that just sees what somebody says to that. And then by attaching those two things together, you get a new piece of knowledge. Um, in, in contrast to the creative writing approach, so people who do supervised learning spend most of their time doing creative writing. People who do unsupervised learning spend most of their time deleting garbage. Because basically, you can't trust the, the wild uh, collection of people on the internet to train the bot accurately. So they tend to teach it a lot of garbage, maybe even like 90% of the stuff that comes in is garbage. And so one response to that is to um, create filtering algorithms, which basically try to automatically filter out the bad responses before the bot learns them. The AIML language includes a, an operator called SRAI, which is the symbolic reduction operator. And this has uh, several different applications in AIML. Um, one is transforming complex forms of inputs into simpler forms. So if the input is, do you know what x is, the SRAI will transform it into the simpler form, what is x? And then if the bot has an answer for what is x, you can use that same answer for do you know what x is. Uh, another application is divide and conquer where the, the sentence, the input sentence is a compound sentence that can be broken down into parts. So the SRAI, SRAI will break the input sentence down into two or more parts, uh, try to search for the answers to both of those parts, and then combine the result together. Uh, <coughs> SRAI is also used for um, synonym resolution. So uh, there, are many, there are many ways of saying, I want text, and say, um, I request X, or can I get X, or I'd really like to have an X. And those can all be reduced with, with um, SRAI to the simpler form, I want X. And then there are um, spelling and grammar corrections, a frequent case where the um, input contains the term, uh, uh, the, word, the term I am as uh, one word without any spaces between the I and the am. So symbolic reduction can transform that into something the bot can actually recognize by expanding the I am into two words. Um, some other applications which there really aren't enough room for in this slide to go into in detail are um, keyword recognition, meaning that um, in many cases the bot master wants to create um, bots that can be activated by a particular keyword appearing anywhere in the sentence. So if the keyword for example, could be um, law firm. The, the term law firm could appear at the beginning of a sentence, at the, in the middle of a sentence, at the end of the sentence, or just law firm by itself. So there have to be AIML categories for each one of those cases that all reduce to one response. And then finally, it's possible to use um, the SRAI for um, conditionals. You know, basically, um, if we know the person's name already, then don't ask them their name, say, say something else that uses their name, but if we don't know the person's name, then try to ask a question that, that um, elicits their name. Um, the main problem with reductions, in the SRAI reductions in AIML, is that it can generate infinite loops. It can generate 
too much recursion in the IML unless there are messages in the number events. And that happens, for example, if you if you have a pattern that says, are you single, it reduces to, are you married? And somewhere else in the IML, there's a pattern that says, are you married, that reduces to, are you single? You can see that this, those will just go around and around in an infinite loop and not generate any response. Um, another example is, in the, in the original Alice bot, a lot of people were saying, who is Richard Wallace? And they would, they would um, misspell my last name, for example. So I created a, a category that's, you know, if they're talking about Richard anyone, ch chances are they're talking about me. So who is Richard anything reduces to who is Richard Wallace. But then someone else could come along and, um, um, and not actually include the response to who is Richard Wallace in their bot, and then the input who is Richard Wallace will continuously activate the same pattern over and over again. Um, so one solution to this problem of infinite recursion, or infinite loops, is to use what we call safe reductions. What makes them safe is that every reduction step reduces the number of words in the input by at least one word. And by the principle of mathematical induction, that means that since every, every activation of the SRAI is reducing the number of words, eventually it's going to reduce to just one word or zero words. So that means that eventually the, the um, looping has to stop. Um, now, um, we, what we did was we created a, we, we went through all of the original Alice reductions and, and modified them so that they have this safe property. And um, every reduction in the safe reduction set now basically reduces the number of inputs, by, uh, number of words in the input by at least one. However, there are some exceptions to that. One is the I am example that I mentioned before, because if the I am, if the input starts with uh, I am, and the, and the client meant to say I space on am, then um, the reduction will, will expand that actually by one word. Or um, if the input is who are you, it might be reduced to a longer expression, what is your name? So the safe reductions are actually just pretty safe, meaning that most of them have this property that they reduce the number of um, words in the input pattern by one, but some, there are some exceptions. And we kind of have to go through those exceptions one by one to make sure that they also will not create infinite loops. <clears throat> now, there's a reason I'm going through all that. Um, in the original Alice bot, there could be a, a category like the first example here, which is basically saying if the if the sentence ends in the word if the input sentence ends in the word thanks, then Break that down into two parts. Respond to the first part by responding to whatever it is using the um, SRAI with just the star value, the, the wildcard value, and then following it up with you are very polite. And when we created the safe reductions, we went through all these cases and modified them so that they turned into sort of pure divide and conquer. So that when the input, the, um, input ends in the word thanks, we now respond to the first part of the input, whatever that is, and then separately to the word thanks. So there's no actual mixing of responses with um, SRAIs in the, in the um, safe reduction set. Safe reductions essentially create a canonical form for the inputs. So um, for example, if the input is please tell me what to call you, um, that can be reduced in one step to tell me what to call you, another step to what to call you, and that reduces to just the word name by itself. Like, like imagine if I'm interviewing you in a very brief format and I say name, age, gender, location, and you sort of fill in those values. So there are a huge number of ways of asking someone their name, but they all reduce to this canonical form of just a single word name. Um, <clears throat> another example is you look very young, reduces to you look young, reduces to how old are you, and finally, just the word age. So basically, we can take any, once we have the safe reduction set, we can take any uh, input to the bot and reduce it to some type of canonical form. Um, 